Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on World Hemophilia Day for this week's National Bleeding Disorders Foundation, formerly National Hemophilia Foundation, Wednesday webinar. My name is Fiona Robinson, and I am the series host. In today's webinar, we will learn about Hemobiologic's latest treatment option for the hemophilia community. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community on the NBDF website shortly after the webinar. We encourage you to ask any questions you may have today. You can ask your question by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the webinar. We will monitor these questions and following our speaker's presentation, we will put your questions to them. <clears throat> this webinar is made possible by Hemobiologics and we thank them very much for their support. Today, we are joined by Dr. Guy Young, pediatric hematologist and director of the Hemostasis and Thrombosis Center at the Children's Hospital, Los Angeles. I'd like to thank Dr. Young for joining us today, and I will turn things over to him now to get us started. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks everybody. To those of you who are listening in, um, watching, um, we are gonna talk about a drug called 7FAC that you may or may not have heard of, and we're gonna we'll get going now. Well, you already got the introduction. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, just briefly, uh, what is life like with an inhibitor? And the reason is that 7-FACT is a factor product that is indicated for the treatment of patients with hemophilia A and B with inhibitors. And we'll get more into the indications uh, momentarily. But if you're wondering why we're we just talking about inhibitors, it's because 7-FACT is only for patients with inhibitors. Then we'll discuss what is 7-FACT, how is it studied, uh, specifically get into the results of the study, the main uh, pivotal trial, which is called PERCEPT-1. We'll get into the safety and the efficacy. Then uh, uh, we'll close with why you might consider 7-FACT, and then briefly about the uh, support programs that are available through hemobiologics, and then where you could go to learn more about 7-FACT. But the bulk of it is that uh, middle section there about uh, how is it studied, uh, what were the results of the study and why you might consider 7-FAC. So um, for those of you listening, um, if you uh, have a hemophilia A or B with an inhibitor, or if you know somebody who does, or if you have a family member who does, um, this will all make perfect sense to you. And, and if you don't, um, hopefully you won't ever have to have to, uh, to, to uh, uh, manage or deal with somebody with an inhibitor because it does make things very challenging. As you can see in these bulleted points here, so first of all, inhibitors are antibodies, and those antibodies basically block the function of factor eight if it's a factor eight inhibitor, factor nine if it's a factor nine inhibitor. So patients who develop inhibitors cannot use sort of the mainstay of treatment uh, for patients with inhibitors uh, for patients without inhibitors, which is factor eight or factor nine concentrates or replacement therapy. And inhibitors are really considered at this point the most serious complication in hemophilia. We have we're thankfully now many years past the. Uh, uh, infectious disease issues uh, in the sense of people still contracting them. Obviously, there are people still living with hepatitis C, HIV, and, and, and that's very unfortunate, of course, and those are serious complications. But at least in our recombinant age, which began in 1992, um, so for about 30 years now, really the most serious complication of factor treatment these days is the development of a factor eight inhibitor. And living with inhibitors is very unpredictable. Uh, Bleeds can happen anytime. They're more difficult to control. Um, and pa pa patients with inhibitors do experience more severe joint disease and disability. And it really impacts the life of the caregivers uh, of children or really even the caregivers uh, of adults if you are the spouse of somebody uh, or, or the parent of an adult patient with an inhibitor who may still be uh, helping your, your, your adult child. That it, it makes things much, much more challenging. And whether you have hemophilia A or B, the development of an inhibitor adds a lot of stress to what's already, you know, a complicated uh, situation, already a disease that is, is difficult enough on a day-to-day -day basis to manage. It makes things just much more complicated. Bleeding events, as we mentioned, are unpredictable and they're unavoidable, essentially, in normal daily life. And when they occur, basically, you have to put your life on hold. You can't work. You have to leave work, perhaps, to take care of a child with an inhibitor. I mean, it really does... Uh, um, uh, complicate, you know, day to day life, and so you know what what we're looking for here, and, and what I'll get to later is that you know we want more predictability when it comes to the management of patients with inhibitors, and we'll get to that as we talk about seven fact. 
So 7FACT, you can see the generic name is coagulation factor 7A recombinant, and it has that four letters J and CW, which is just a random four letter code, which distinguishes it from any other factor 7As that may come into the market in, in the future. Um, of course, there is a factor 7A on the market already that's been around for a couple of decades that you're probably familiar with called Novo7. So let's first talk about the indications and usage. So 7FACT is indicated for the treatment and control of bleeding episodes occurring in adults and adolescents 12 years of age and older with hemophilia A or B with inhibitors. 7FACT is not intended or not indicated for the treatment of patients with congenital factor 7 deficiency. So let me just um, uh, read between the lines here a little bit. First of all, you'll notice it's only 12 and older. Um, there is a pediatric study. It has been completed. It has been published. Um, however, uh, the data from that pediatric study was not acceptable to the FDA uh, for a variety of reasons that, that I won't get into. Uh, but it's not that the company ignored children or didn't want to study this in children. So, and, and you can, if you're interested, I'm sure that you can find uh, that study uh, online. Um, that it was it was called Percept Three, I believe. That no Percept Two. So anyway, um, and then why does it say it's not indicated for patients with congenital factor seven deficiency? And the reason for that is that the other factor seven A Novo Seven is indicated for that. Uh, factor seven deficiency, but seven fact has not been studied in that. Uh, but the other important thing is this is for patients with hemophilia A or B with inhibitors, so only for patients with inhibitors. And then there's this boxed warning thrombosis says serious arterial and venous thrombotic events may occur following administration of seven fact, discuss the risks and explain the signs and symptoms of thrombotic and thromboembolic events to patients who will receive seven fact and monitor patients for signs and symptoms of activation of the coagulation system and for thrombosis. I do want to point out here that this box warning is not unique to 7FACT. Um, Novo7 uh, has a similar box warning, and, and the other bypassing agent that you might have heard of called FIBA also has a similar boxed warning. So this is not something that is like unique to 7FACT, that it's got this warning about thrombosis. All the bypassing agents, which are the drugs we would use to treat bleeding in patients with hemophilia A or B with inhibitors, all have some similar box warning language. Okay, so how does 7FACT work? Well, it works um, in your body at the site of bleeding. And you can see in this cartoon here, we have a blood vessel at the top. You can see it's broken where it says bleed. And the first thing that happens is platelets go to the site to try to stop the bleeding. But then we also need uh, basically fib fibrin. Fibrin is the, by the name, you can see it's the fibrous material that makes up the, essentially the cement of the clot uh, while the platelets make up the stones of the clot. And what 7FACT does is it works within our coagulation system to convert prothrombin to thrombin. It basically generates what we call a thrombin burst. And we want this large burst of thrombin to happen because that's what's needed to convert a large amount of fibrinogen to the proper form of fibrin to help make the clot. So 7FACT really is working within our coagulation system to help make a thrombin burst in people with hemophilia A or B with inhibitors who A, do not have factor eight or do not have factor nine, as you can see, and that factor eight and factor nine are not in there um, in that little cartoon. And then also for patients with inhibitors, you can't give factor eight or factor nine, it won't work. So that's how seven fact kind of jumps in to basically do that work in the absence of factor eight or factor nine to generate the thrombin burst. So how was seven fact studied? Well, we'll get into the details of, of, of the study soon. Uh, but you can see at the bottom there is that there were 27 participants who treated 465 bleeding episodes total. So that's quite a large number of bleeding episodes were treated. These patients ranged in age from 12 to 54. Successful treatment basically meant that the patients at home uh, stated that their bleed had a good or excellent patient assessed response. And we'll get into that momentarily that there was no additional treatment with 7FACT or any other hemostatic agent after 12 hours. So in other words, once the bleed stopped, it didn't, need, didn't come back again, essentially, and there was no increase in pain after 12 hours. So let's dive into a little more detail here. So this was a home treatment study. In fact, almost all of those 465 bleeds were treated at home by the patients themselves or the parents, if these were the younger part of the age group there, the 12, 13, 14-year-olds, and basically, one of the tools to determine if 7FACT worked 
was a, uh, a home assessment where the patient themselves, or in some cases, the parent, would basically make a judgment that the bleed response was either excellent, good, moderate, or none. Those are their four choices. Excellent meant full relief of pain and cessation of objective signs of bleeding. Basically, the bleed stopped. And no additional use of 7-fact was required after they said the bleed stopped. That would be considered excellent. Good is that the symptoms of bleeding had largely been reduced. So the bleed was substantially better, but not completely disappeared. And again, the symptoms improved enough that no more 7 fact was needed. That was considered good. Moderate was there was some effect. In other words, the patient noticed something, but the bleeding had continued. And none, of course, means there was no noticeable effect of the treatment. If the patient rated their bleed as excellent or good, that was considered a satisfactory response. If it was moderate or none, that was an unsatisfactory response. And this was one of the criteria that determined if 7-FAC worked or not. And I'm going to show you the other criteria now. Um, so first of all, there were two different dosing regimens, and I'm going to explain that a little bit in more detail in, a couple, in the next slide, I believe. But basically, we call these IDRs, or initial dose regimen. So initial dose regimen, meaning the first dose. And so you can see at the top, there was one dosing regimen. There was 75 micrograms per kilogram. And the patient would give themselves that dose at home when they had a bleed. Then the patient could continue to give 7-fac every three hours at the same dose. That's what you see in that timeline, hour 3, 6, 9, 12, and so on. The box around 12 is that was the main study endpoint. And then the second endpoint was 24 hours. Now, the patient didn't have to keep giving 7-fact. At any point on this timeline, they could decide not to give more because they felt their bleed had stopped. So some patients would only get that first dose. Some would get another dose at three hours. Some would get two doses at hour three and six, and so on. So in order for, in order for the response to treatment to be considered uh, in responsive, in other words, for, for the outcome to be satisfactory, First, the patient had to rate their bleed outcome at home as excellent or good, as I just went over with you. And they could not give any additional 7-fact or blood products through those first 24 hours once they said the bleed was excellent or good. And they couldn't give any other hemostatic agent. So they couldn't give like Novo 7 or Fiba. Obviously, if that happened, that means it wasn't a good response. And there was no increase in pain through 24 hours. There could still be pain, but it could not be increasing. It should be the same or decreasing. All four of those criteria had to be met for the treatment to be considered effective. And that would be the end point at which point we would say the bleed was effective was anywhere along that timeline. Now, at the bottom, you see a different dosing regimen, which is the 225 microgram per kilogram initial dose regimen. So that's a dose that is three times higher than 75. If the patient was getting that dose, uh, then they would give that dose, but then they could not repeat the dose until hour nine. At hour nine, they could give another dose if they felt they needed it, but that dose is the 75 microgram per kilogram dose that you see in the top line as well. And then they could give additional doses every three hours. What this did was essentially equalize so that by hour nine, if a patient on the 75 microgram IDR gave a dose at hour three and six, they would have by then had 225 micrograms per kilogram as they got to hour nine. So it'd be the same total dose as the bottom. Um, and basically the rating system was the same. Um, now, how did patients end up on these arms? I don't think it's not in this slide deck, but basically patients would be randomized. So flip of the coin to get on one of the dosing regimens or the other. And then they would stick with that for three months. And then after three months, they flipped and they would go to the other dosing regimen. And after three months, they would flip back and they keep going back and forth every three months so that every single patient got to try both different dosing regimens. So 7-FAC was proven to work across a range of different types of bleeds. So you can see most common bleeds, I can tell you it's not listed here in the number, but joint bleeds, not surprising. Knees, elbows, and ankles, the most common, but there were also shoulder bleeds in the trial, wrist and hand bleeds, hip bleeds, and there are also soft tissue bleeds like mouth, like nose and mouth, but also soft tissue muscle bleeds as well. And 
one of the main bottom lines here is that 7FAC was shown to control 84% of the bleeding episodes with just one dose of the higher dosing regimen of 225 micrograms per kilogram. And this really adds uh, a measure of predictability. Like if you know that you've got an 84% chance that one dose will get rid of your bleed, then you could maybe give that dose and, you know, depending on the bleed, maybe you would rest up at home or maybe you could, you know, give it a little bit of time and then get on with your activities. But at least you have this sort of predictability. And we're going to come back to this data in more detail more soon. So I already mentioned the initial dosing regimens. And I think the only other point I want to make here is that this is something that is unique to 7 fat. The other Factor 7A on the market, Novo 7, only has one dosing regimen. It doesn't have this option of two different dosing regimens. Uh, and so that, again, that, that is one separator, one unique thing that 7 fat offers. Now, those, that, that, those two dosing regimens were for mild and moderate bleeds. Now, I will tell you that there were 468 bleeds total, of which 465 were mild or moderate. So almost all the bleeds in the trial were mild or moderate. These were your joint bleeds, your mi minor muscle bleeds, things like that. We'll talk about the severe bleeding episodes uh, in a minute. But if for the severe bleeding episode, there was a different dosing regimen, everybody got the 225 microgram per kilogram IDR, and the follow-up doses were a little bit different. But that's what the IDR is. So let's look at some of the results. So here we have the 75 microgram per kilogram IDR. And at three hours, meaning single dose efficacy, what percentage of patients had a response at three hours where they did not have to give more seven fat? And you can see that it's 29%, about a quarter to a third. By 12 hours, it was 82%. So those patients would give probably additional doses at hour six and nine, so that by 12 hours, most of the patients uh, had a bleed that was considered to be controlled. So just remember that I'm going to contrast that with the 225 microgram IDR, which is right here. So the 225 microgram IDR, per the protocol, per the instructions of the study, the patients only needed to rate their response by nine hours because that's when you would expect the full effect at that point of the single dose. Because remember, they couldn't give another dose at hour three or six. So the single dose efficacy is 84%. Compare that to the 29% with one dose of the lower dose. And obviously this is substantially better. By 12 hours, they're a little bit more similar. Here it's 91%, remember it's 82% for the uh, lower IDR. And again, I will you know, when we get to the end, we'll summarize and show you all the numbers together. One other important feature here is at the bottom of the slide, where it says 84% of bleeding episodes were resolved at three hours. Now, the patients were not required to report a result at three hours when they were on the 225 microgram IDR. But many of the patients had, you know, with this home electronic diary, uh, did decide to make that report. And so when you see this 84% single dose efficacy, what that really means is even though it says nine hours, it means that all of those patients actually felt their bleed was resolved by three hours because 84% of them said their bleed resolved by three hours. So not only is it a single dose, but also resolved more quickly. So let's take a little bit step back and see, you know, who was on this study. There were 27 patients, as I mentioned. Almost all of them had hemophilia A, and that's for two reasons. One is hemophilia A is more common. It's about four times more common than hemophilia B. And inhibitors are much more common in hemophilia A. In fact, hemophilia B inhibitors are quite rare. So this is pretty representative of what you'd expect in an inhibitor population. Also, most of the patients had severe hemophilia. Again, not surprising because inhibitors mostly happen in severe hemophilia. You can see that the factor level at baseline was less than 1% for on average for all the patients. And then the inhibitor status below, it really, that, there's the 27 patients. And what this really means is that none of these patients could use factor eight or factor nine to treat their bleeds. 14 of them had a tighter, basically the level of their inhibitor was more than five. The BU stands for Bethesda units, which is just how we measure that. Um, if you're more than five, you can't use factor. It's not going to work. Uh, 11 had a level at the time of initiating the study that was less than five, but we know they have something called an anamnestic response, which means as soon as you give a dose of factor, they shoot way up above five. 
So there's no point giving them factor. And then there were two that were less than five, but even when they were using regular factor eight or factor nine, it didn't work. So the bottom line here, all these patients relied upon bypassing agents to treat their bleeds. So let's jump to 24 hours. And at 24 hours, you can see the higher IDR in orange, 225, was 99.5% bleeds resolved, and the lower IDR was 96.7%. So essentially, nearly all the bleeds resolved in all the patients, regardless of whether they're on the lower or the higher IDR. And I don't really consider this difference to be all that meaningful. We're talking you know, very small percentages at the very high end. So I wouldn't take this to mean, oh, the 225 works better at 24 hours. By 24 hours, they're pretty much the same. Importantly, out of the 465 bleeds, only one rebled. Rebleeding meant that within 72 hours, the same joint was bleeding again. And this is really important because rebleeding is common in inhibitor patients. So they stop their treatment and then within two to three days, that same joint bleeds again. In this case, that only happened to one uh, of the bleeds out of the 465, so obviously very, very low. So just briefly, the severe bleeding episode. So a severe bleeding episode is really determined by the patient at home. If they thought their bleed was severe, um, then they would use this dosing regimen, which always uses the higher initial dose, 225. So even if at this point they were randomized to the lower dose, if they felt the bleed was severe, they would just use the 225. And you'll notice that the frequency of the follow-up doses is different. You didn't have to wait nine hours to give another dose. You only had to wait six. And then instead of waiting every three hours to give a dose, you can give one every two hours as marked by the 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on. So that's how severe bleeding episodes were treated. Now, there are only three severe bleeding episodes out of the 468 bleeds in total. So anything I say here, you just have to take a little bit with a grain of salt because the numbers are so small. But what were the bleeding episodes? One was a traumatic intramuscular bleeding episode. It was treated with one dose of the 225 microgram per kilogram of 7-fat, and that was it. The second one was a spontaneous renal hemorrhage. Renal means kidney, so that means they probably had blood in their urine. And it was treated with five doses of 7 fact, the 225, and then four follow-up doses of 75 at hours 6, 8, 10, and 12. And the third was a spontaneous hip bleeding event. Um, and this was treated with the 225 dose, of course, and then an additional dose at hour 6 and 12. So this patient skipped giving the dose at hour 8 and 10. You know, that's, we call that a protocol deviation because they didn't follow the protocol. It's not a terrible thing. We try to avoid those, but it's not a terrible thing. But the point here is that there's only three bleeding episodes. Like I said, take this with a grain of salt, but all three were treated within 12 hours. So nobody was giving factor for their severe bleed beyond 12 hours. One patient got one dose, second patient got five doses, the third patient got three doses. So let's talk about the safety information because this is really important. So what is the most important information that, that you as listening here should know about 7-FACT? The most serious possible side effect of 7-FACT is abnormal clotting involving blockage of the blood vessels, which could include stroke, blockage of the main blood vessel to the lung, which is a pulmonary embolism, or deep vein blood clots, which we call deep vein thrombosis. So you should definitely know what the signs and symptoms are of abnormal clotting, which would be things like swelling and the pain, swelling and pain in your limbs, new onset of chest pain, shortness of breath, loss of sensation or motor power, or like you can't use your one side of your body, or altered consciousness or speech. So those are just signs of blood clotting um, possibilities. And again, these are all possible side effects. Um, what is 7-Fact? It's obviously it's an injectable medicine, uh, as all hemophilia factor products are. And we already discussed who it's for. He may be inhibitor patient. He, patients with hemophilia A or B with inhibitors older than 12. Of course, it says injecting medicines require special training. Now, if you have an inhibitor, well, you, you already have that training. But uh, it still has to say here that you should not attempt to self-infuse unless you are taught how to do so by your healthcare provider. But I think we all know anybody who's got hemophilia, especially those with inhibitors, you're probably professionals, unfortunately, I uh, hear professionals are doing self-infusion. Who should not use 7 facts? So you should not use 7 facts if you're allergic to rabbits. I know that sounds really weird. I will explain that in a moment. Or if you have known allergies to 7 fact or any of its components, it says seek immediate medical help if you're experiencing basically symptoms of allergies, which could include hives, itching, rash, difficulty breathing with cough or wheezing, swelling around the mouth and throat, 
tightness of the chest, dizziness, or fainting, or low blood pressure. Um, and of course, tell your healthcare provider um, if you started treating a bleeding episode with another bypassing agent. So if you started treating a bleeding episode with Fiba or Novo 7, and you want to use 7-Fac, definitely talk to your healthcare provider before you do that. What's the deal with the rabbits? Well, 7-Fac is manufactured in live rabbits. Um, yes, that is a technology called transgenic medicine. You could put the gene for one animal inside another animal, and then that animal could produce that protein. So in this case, the gene for 7-Fac is put into these rabbits. Um, these rabbits then will express the 7-Fac in their milk. And then the milk is collected, uh, harvested, and then basically the uh, from that milk, it's purified, obviously taking out all the components other than the 7-Fac um, uh, and then some, some stabilizers that are in there. So in theory, if you're allergic to rabbits, there could be some rabbit protein in there. And that's why they're saying if you're allergic to rab rabbits, you should not get seven facts. And I know this is true because I actually been to the rabbit farm. It's uh, a little bit east of Boston and Massachusetts. And I actually saw the rabbits being milked. And yes, you, you, can, you can do that. It's in a very highly specialized facility. It's not like the rabbits are running around the woods and then coming back to be milked. They're kept inside a very special clean facility. What should you tell your healthcare provider before you use 7-Fac? Well, uh, you should tell them if you're pregnant, nursing, or plan to become pregnant. I know that sounds weird because hemophilia is almost mostly in boys and, and severe hemophilia even more so and inhibitors even more so. But, um, you know, so it hasn't been studied. Only men and uh, boys were studied. And so we don't know whether or not it's safe to give if you're pregnant or nursing or plan to become pregnant. So that's just sort of standard language in these types of um, documents from the FDA. But the, more importantly, if you've had prior blood clots, heart disease or heart failure, abnormal heart rhythms, prior pulmonary clots, pulmonary embolism, heart surgery, yes, you should let your doctor know. I imagine, you know, if you've been seeing the same doctor, they probably already know this, but um, in case you're moving to another doctor who wants to prescribe you 7-Fact, be sure to let them know if you have a history of blood clotting or heart issues. And the most common side effects of 7-Fact that were seen in the trials are headaches, dizziness, and things related to the infusion, such as infusion site discomfort, infusion site hematoma, which is a bruise, or infusion-related reaction and fever. And obviously, if you are concerned you might have a blood clot, you need to seek immediate medical help, as well as if you have suspect an allergic reaction. Um, if you know of somebody or you've had some adverse reaction to 7-Fact, um, then you, you should report this, and you can report it to hemobiologics, or you can report it directly to the Food and Drug Administration via phone number or website, so you can kind of see the ways that you can do that if you feel that that's happened. So um, let's talk about the manufacturing. I already mentioned that it's, uh, that the, that this uh, seven pack is expressed in the milk of the rabbits. And then it goes through this very extensive purification process, removing all viruses. Um, another process that removes all other proteins called affinity gel chromatography. Then this other eluate, which washes out all this other unnecessary material and then a bunch of other purification steps. So in the vial, you basically have pure 7-fac along with just some molecules that are there as like stabilizers. Those are called like excipients that can keep the molecule stable. Well, so let's talk about the safety profile. Well, I already kind of read that in the, uh, you can see the table here uh, of the adverse events that actually happen in the trials. I already pretty much went through that. You can see mostly it's things related to the infusion um, uh, uh, of those reactions. There's two that have dizziness and one with a headache, which is a bit different. Importantly, on the right side in orange, you see that in the trial, remember four, four, 27 patients, 465 bleeds, there were no antibodies that developed a seven fact. There were no allergic reactions and there were no blood clots. Now, again, it doesn't mean an allergic reaction can never happen and it doesn't mean blood clots can never happen. But in the trial, we didn't see any of that with those 465 treated bleeds. 7-Fact is convenient to store and convenient to use. So 7-Fact can be infused in two minutes or less. So it's a quick infusion. Once you mix it, um, uh, it can be uh, after reconstitution and it's mixed because um, it comes in a powder and liquid, as you'll see in a moment. Um, it can be uh, safe to use up to four hours. So you know, why is that important? Well, let's say you are, you mix it and you're trying to access your vein and for some reason you're having some trouble you can get some help um, either from a family member or uh, hopefully get a home nurse to you, or if not, go to your treatment center. Um, and you can still use that 7-Fact up to four hours after the infusion. 
It is easy to store. It can be stored at room temperature. Um, and so yeah, not too, too hot, but obviously most people don't keep their house below 36, I hope not, or above 86. Uh, so you can store it at, at, uh, at any, any of those temperatures. It definitely should not be frozen, but it definitely should be protected from light. So somewhere in a cabinet, or pantry is fine. Uh, it can be stored in a refrigerator as well. So it's not like you can't put it in the refrigerator. Um, you can put it in the refrigerator, um, but you don't have to. So this is what the kit, uh, the box looks like. Um, so there's a mixing uh, process that is easy. So basically in the box, you get a vial of 7-Fac. You get a pre-filled reconstitution syringe. So that syringe already has the diluent in it. So it's not, not like a separate vial. You have to like connect two needles. And we know that sometimes that could be a bit annoying. Uh, there's a vial adapter um, that has a filter needle, a filter in there. And basically you would... Um, put the liquid into that powder, into the vial that has the powder, you gently mix it, and then you would draw it up uh, and through that uh, as filtered needle, a uh, filter um, adapter, and then you'll have it uh, ready for use. Um, Seven Fact does come in two different vial sizes. We have one milligram, which is the yellow two, yellow caps, five milligrams, the purple caps. As you saw, the dosing is weight-based, and also dependent on if you're on the high IDR or the low IDR. So your hemophilia treatment center team, whether it's your doctor, your nurse, and your pharmacist together, they'll figure out which combination of vials you need for your specific dosing regimen. So to summarize, um, 7FACT has rapid action. 84% of mild and moderate bleeding episodes were controlled by three hours with a 225 microgram per kilogram dose. It has single dose efficacy. So just one dose, one infusion for 84% of the bleeds uh, were treated with just the one infusion. So rapid action with just one infusion at the higher IDR. You can see there in the chart on the bottom left, the efficacy at 12 and 24 hours. At 12 hours, the, seven, the higher dose does look a bit better at 91%. 24 hours, they more or less equalize. Safety-wise, again, I just mentioned there were no thrombotic events, no antibodies to 7-FACT, and no severe adverse events that were related to the treatment. And it is convenient for home use. I already mentioned that 98% of the bleeding episodes in the trial were treated at home. Uh, the other 2% was patients either needing to get admitted because of pain or needing help with their infusion. But obviously, the vast, vast majority were treated at home. Okay, so now what about Hemlibra? So, uh, when 7-FACT uh, was studied uh, in this clinical trial that I just showed you, uh, Hemlibra was not yet widely available. And so the patients on the trial, none of these hemophilia A patients with inhibitors were on Hemlibra. Obviously, most hemophilia A patients in the U.S. today are on Hemlibra, as they should be, uh, to prevent bleeding. So remember, Hemlibra is to prevent bleeding. It is not to treat bleeding. 7-FACT is to treat bleeding not to prevent bleeding. But there was a bit of a concern in the community that said, well, hang on a second, you know, uh, now that all the heme patients are on seven are in Hemlibra, most of them, can they use 7-FACT? And so the National Hemophilia Foundation, as we now know, is called the National Bleeding Disorder Foundation, but when this was written, it was still NHF. The MASAC, which is the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council, which is an arm of NHF composed of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, um, basically supports the use of 7-FACT at the lower IDR, 75 micrograms per kilogram, for the treatment of breakthrough bleeding events in patients with hemophilia A with inhibitors who are on Hemlibra. So there isn't a, a lot of information in the clinical uh, world about this because, again, uh, the trial was done before Hemlibra was available. But uh, if you're on Hemlibra, uh, we do believe that it is safe uh, to use 7-FACT if you choose to do that to manage your breakthrough bleeding. So as I get to the end here, the, the question really is, could 7-FACT be an option for you? So the first comment, of course, is only you and your healthcare provider can make the best treatment decision for you or your loved one. So something to discuss with your, with your HTC or healthcare team. But the questions to think about is, how long does it take right now for you to get a bleed under control? Um, is it taking eight hours, 12 hours, 36 hours? Um, if it's really taking a long time, I think you saw with the data on 7-FACT that most of the bleeds get controlled quite quickly. How many doses does it take to stop a bleed? Are you, is it one or two? In which case you're 
doing well with what you're on, or is it four, six, eight, ten, which is definitely more common. Um, and if it's taking that many doses, you could you saw with seven fact that you know typically is you know one one dose or even on the lower IDR it was basically three doses that resolved most of the bleeds. Um, and then how much how often is your life interrupted to infuse? Right, if you're having to do four infusions a day for three days, that's very interrupt, you know, very intrusive on your lifestyle. Um, if you can just get away with one or two infusions, obviously that'll make things better. <clears throat> what should you ask yourself, healthcare provider? Well, is seven fact an option for you? If it is an option, is the higher IDR appropriate for you? Because clearly I showed you that it does work better. And how does that fit into your overall treatment regimen? You know, which meaning like if you're on Hemlieber or whatever other medication you might be on to prevent bleeding if you're on one of those. So lastly, um, patient support program. So Hemobiologics has a program called Hemobiologics Cares, which is a support program. And you can see the support services there. So for those of you who might have a large copay, uh, they can help cover the copay up to $12,000 per year. Then obviously I have to qualify for that program and that's only uh, for commercial patients. Um, patients on Medicaid typically don't have to pay the copays anyway. Um, there's a patient assistance program. So we know not everyone has health insurance. And so some people really are falling in between those gaps we have in our healthcare system. So you could get some free product. Um, there's a quick start program. So if you're like, hmm, I really am interested in 7FACT and I'd like to give it a try, but maybe without a full commitment, um, you can get uh, some doses to get started with. And also if there's a delay in getting coverage for your prescription, there's a bridge program. So if you've been on 7FACT already, <clears throat> and now you switched insurance and now your new insurance is where, what do you have? What is hemophilia? And now all of a sudden you're running out of 7 fact. they can provide you doses uh, to bridge you from one insurance to another. There's also a benefit investigation coverage determination team and prior authorization support. So all of that can be found um, at the website, 7fact.com website. And also there's a phone number for those of you who prefer to use that method. And then truly the last slide is uh, where can you go to learn more about 7fact? Again, the website, 7fact.com. There happens to be a reconstitution video on the website, so you can see how to do the reconstitution. And then there's a phone number and there's an uh, uh, email as well if you prefer to use those routes. And so with that, I'm going to stop and uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, I think they asked you to use the Q&A at the bottom. And uh, so feel free to do that. I don't know, Fiona, if there's another way they can ask questions, but I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, certainly. Thank you very much, Dr. Young. Really interesting introduction to, to Seven Fact. And we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, for technical reasons, our Restream LinkedIn and YouTube Live will terminate now. So we thank people who have joined us that way for being with us today and look forward to seeing them again next week for another Wednesday webinar.